Hello, saints. Peace, love, and grace in Christ Jesus be with all of you. You know, it's been a while since I made a video, and I think uh, we're due for one. You know, you're probably just as amazed, amazed as I am by the number of people, both Christians and non-Christians, who believe that our Lord Jesus was born on December 25th. Now, just like all the other misconceptions regarding God's truth, the fault lies within the lack of right division, the lack of reading God's word. So, I think it's time we do a study on the birth of our Lord Jesus, specifically the timing of his birth. Considering the time of year that we're in right now, and in this study we're going to be looking at two things. First, the exact date of our Lord's birth and second we're gonna look at what we should do as members of the body of Christ now that you know this information after the video now if you stop the average person on the street and you ask them the question uh, when was Jesus Christ born 99.9% .9 of the time their answer is gonna be December 25th and I think there's basically two reasons for that First, because the people teaching, the preachers, the pastors, they really don't have a clue either, and they're teaching what they've been taught to teach. They're teaching the traditions instead of right division, and they're confusing people by doing that. The second reason is because people, uh, believe it or not, it's a lack of education. There's people out there that think the word conceive means to give birth. And this causes problems because when they read that Mary conceived Jesus in the month of December, they think it's saying that she gave birth to Jesus in December. Again, the result of not rightly dividing the word of truth and also along with that, a lack of education. Now, instead of looking up the word conceive, they get lazy and they believe what they hear others say and uh, well if those others are just as confused then you can see how ignorance and laziness can cause a big old mess and that's why it's important to study to show thyself approved it's basically the blind leading the blind paradox if you will second timothy 2 15 to 16 study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth but sh shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness now before we get into the study let me ask you a question what does Paul mean by rightly dividing the word of truth keep in mind that when Paul wrote this to Timothy there was no Bible there was no King James Version Bible. The 66 books, including Paul's 13 books, didn't exist. So, rightly dividing here in context cannot mean dividing the Bible into sections of dispensations. That's not what Paul meant by right division. The simplest explanation of right division is this. Answering the questions, who, what, where, when, and how. Okay, for example... Who's being spoken to? Who's being spoken about? What's being said? You know, the context of the passage. Where is it taking place? In what country? What group of people? And when in history did it take place? Was it before Christ Jesus? Was it during Christ Jesus' uh, walk on earth? Was it after his resurrection? And so on. And how? How does it apply to us today? Or does it apply to us today at all? Was it just for the nation of Israel? Or was it for the body of Christ? Or is it for both groups? Okay, All these questions lead us to rightly divide God's word. And it prevents all kinds of problems that lead to false teaching, traditions, etc. Do you know one of the biggest reasons for the nation of Israel missing the arrival of their Messiah was because they didn't rightly divide scripture. In fact, they intentionally kept most, the most important scripture hidden just before, during, and after our Lord's resurrection, even calling it the forbidden passage. 
and refusing to teach it in the synagogues. The forbidden passage is in Isaiah 53. Let's read it together and tell me who you think this passage is talking about. If only they paid attention to this. It's almost as if the powers that be during that time knew that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, but because of their greed, their embarrassment, and their need for power over the people, they intentionally rejected our Lord Jesus. And so let's read Isaiah 53. And let me ask you again, who is Isaiah talking about here? Isaiah 53 verse 1, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised and we esteemed him not surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of god and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of his of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb so he openeth not his mouth he was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his own soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The Forbidden Passage Surely after they killed their Messiah Jesus, the Jewish scholars went back to Isaiah 53 and realized they made a huge mistake then they make it the forbidden passage to hide the fact that Christ Jesus was and is their one and only Messiah how sad it is truly truly very sad but in this study let's go ahead and take a look at when our Lord Jesus was born Okay, let's start with the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia. And his wife was the daughters of, was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now a bit of history concerning the priestly order under King David. Under King David, Israel's priests were organized into 24 different courses or sections, okay? A, and a priest from each course served a week in the temple ministry. So each priest served twice a year for a week at a time. Good so far? Okay. 
Israel's calendar begins with Nisan, Abib, equivalent to the period of or the months of March 16 through April 15th. And Passover was observed on April 14th during this time we're, we're speaking of here in Luke, starting Israel's religious calendar. Passover week, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, lasted from April 15th through the 21st. So we know exactly the period of time that we're dealing with. Now, the first course of the priests served in the temple around this time that we're talking about. And Zacharias's course, Abijah, was the eighth course after Passover. If you want to read about that, it's in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 10 for, for further uh, study. Okay, and this places Zacharias, his service, roughly eight weeks after Passover or roughly June 17th through the 23rd. If you feel overwhelmed with all the numbers and dates at this point, don't worry about it. It's okay. I'm going to simplify things in a little bit. All right. It's all going to make sense. In this next passage, we're looking at when the angel appeared to Zacharias to announce John's conception, when John the Baptist would be conceived, when Elizabeth would become pregnant with John. In Luke 1, 8 to 22, and it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife, Elizabeth, shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call him, his name shall be John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answered, answering said unto him I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings and behold thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season and the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple and when he came out, he couldn't speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, and for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. So, Zacharias is performing his priestly duties inside the temple about two months after Passover, roughly in the months of June and July, and we read that the angel comes to him, the angel Gabriel comes to Zacharias and tells him that his, that his wife Elizabeth is about to get pregnant and the baby's name would be John. We know this John as John the Baptist. But because Zacharias hesitates with doubt, okay, what the angel says, the angel strikes Zacharias with dumbness, he turns him into a mute, and Zacharias is unable to speak when he comes out of the temple. Once Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth leave the temple service, when Zacharias is all done with his ministry, he goes home, he brings his wife Elizabeth with him, and she conceives. She gets pregnant with John the Baptist. In Luke 1, 23-25, And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed 
to his own house and after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived she got pregnant and hid herself five months saying thus had the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men take a look at the next verse in verse 26 and in the sixth month now note here what is this sixth month that we're talking about this is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy not the sixth month of the year but this is in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary and the angel came in unto her and said hail thou that art highly favored the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and when she saw him she was troubled at his sayings and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be and the angel said unto her fear not Mary for thou hast found favor with God and behold thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end then said Mary unto the angel how shall this be seeing I know not a man she's saying I'm a virgin how, how is it possible that I can be pregnant if I'm a virgin verse 35 and the angel answered and said unto her the Holy Ghost shall come unto thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God and behold thy cousin Elizabeth she hath also conceived a son in her old age and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren for with God nothing shall be impossible and Mary said behold the handmaiden of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word and the angel departed from her okay so let's recap we know Elizabeth gets pregnant two months after Passover roughly in the month of June then in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy the angel Gabriel goes to Mary and Mary gets pregnant the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary and she gets pregnant so June plus six months brings us to the month of December right around December Mary gets pregnant she conceives in December she gets pregnant with Jesus in December now December plus nine months comes to the month of September time frame right the vision of God's Word wins once again my friends now we can narrow it down even further we know also that the Mosaic laws and all the Hebraic customs revolved around feast days the word feast in the Bible doesn't mean a great big gathering where people eat a bunch of food like Thanksgiving and all in that the word feast in the Bible means a divine appointment between God and the nation of Israel the feast days were days that God appointed for his people Israel to stop what they were doing and to rehearse God's plans for the future in other words it was a dress rehearsal feast days are celebrations that were forecasting a future event that would take place between God and the nation of Israel another way to explain it is if you're if, if you look at weddings today usually there is a rehearsal dinner right there's a rehearsal dinner before the actual wedding where the wedding party shows up the bride and groom show up and they practice the ceremony and they have a dinner well this is a rehearsal this would be the same thing as calling it a feast okay it's a divine appointment for everybody to show up at this rehearsal to, to plan for the actual wedding God's feast days are very much the same thing as our wedding rehearsals today all the feasts that God has uh, told the nation of Israel to take part in were rehearsals for future events okay for example the feast of Passover 
started long before our Lord was crucified, and God started the Feast of Passover at a rehearsal, or as a rehearsal for when he'd be crucified on the cross. We read in Exodus how the Feast of Passover began. The nation of Israel, the Israelites, were told to put the blood of the lamb on the top and the sides of the doorposts. Notice it's the same shape of the cross. God told them that if they did this, the angel of death would pass over them and they'd be protected on the night when all the firstborn males were killed in Egypt. This is when Passover began. It was a sign of a future event when Jesus would be selected as the perfect lamb to shed his blood that whoever believed, believed in him would be passed over by the second death. Keeping this in mind, we know that the spring feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost, have all been fulfilled with the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, and Pentecost. So the remaining three feasts are yet to be fulfilled, and they're going to be fulfilled when our Lord, Lord returns at the second coming. So what does this have to do with the birth of our Lord Jesus? Well, it's highly probable that our Lord was born on one of the fall feasts, specifically the Feast of Tabernacle. And here's why. The Feast of Tabernacle, the word tabernacle means God dwelling among his people. And clearly, Jesus, God in the flesh, being born and dwelling among his people, is tabernacling. Okay, This leads to our Lord Jesus being born in the month of September on the feast day of tabernacle. And what tabernacles was, was on is easy to find by tracing back the dates uh, to that period of time. Now, sadly, very few Jews were paying attention that all these prophecies concerning Jesus, his name, Emmanuel, uh, God with us, was taking place right before their eyes. You see, the Jews were more wrapped up in their laws than they were about the coming Messiah. And this caused their demise, even unto this day. In John 1.14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, so why all this confusion? If the nation of Israel would have accepted Jesus as their Messiah, then the fall feast would have been fulfilled immediately at that time. But because they rejected our Lord Jesus as their Messiah, the fall feasts are still open to be fulfilled. And now we know that they're going to be fulfilled at the second coming after Daniel's 70th week, after the removal of the body of Christ, and the completion of the gospel of grace. All this confusion boils down to two things. Two, reason, two reasons why there's confusion concerning Jesus' true birth date is this. First, right division. Even back then, over three or two to three or four thousand years ago, they weren't rightly dividing God's word and his prophecies. And the plague of not rightly dividing still exists today, causing all kinds of problems, creating false religions and contention and confusion and so on. Second is the author of confusion, the father of lies, the father of counterfeiting. Satan is the master counterfeiter from Genesis to Revelation. The scriptures reveal how the devil will do anything to be like the Most High. Whatever God does, Satan defiles whatever he does. How does he do that? He introduces false doctrines. He distracts mankind from God's truth by mimicking his actions, discouraging God's people by using incorrect thinking patterns and so on. Why? Well, Satan wants to be worshipped like God is worshipped. He wants to be God. One example, take a look at Easter. Long, long before our Lord Jesus was in the flesh, Satan created celebrations to take place during the spring feast. Because he knew God would, was going to use the spring feast in a very big way sometime in the future. So basically, Satan hijacks the spring feast. 
and he replaces them by creating celebrations for false gods and deities. He creates the goddess of Ishtar. Okay, Easter, Ishtar, Isis, Tammuz, Ra, the sun god, and so on. Now, consider Christmas, or the, the period of what we call Christmas time, for lack of a better word, centuries before Christ uh, was around, Satan had pagan celebrations worshipping the birth of the sun, the birth of the sun god in early winter near the date that Jesus Christ would be born. Sometime in the late fall, in the winter. But because Satan is not all-knowing, he's not omniscient or omnipotent, he got it wrong by a few months. But he knew it was going to be sometime in the fall or the beginning of, of winter and so on. So he created all those false celebrations, those pagan celebrations during that time. Dear friends, take a look around and look at the billions of people on this planet right now that are still worshipping on these pagan dates that Satan created. It's still being done today. And it's a sign of how blind the world really is. So we get to the next objective of this study. Now that you know when our Lord was born and when he wasn't born, what should we do about this knowing this truth? Well, number one, what you do is between you and the Lord. Also know that every day on the calendar belongs to our Lord God. He created all of them. No matter how much the enemy wants to steal those days from him, God controls and owns all things, all days. And we're to be thankful for every day. Not just some of the days, not a, just a particular day, but we're to be thankful and celebrate every day. Amen? The second thing now that you know the truth, you're responsible to teach this truth to other saints. Share with them the right division and show them why it's so important. The third thing, if, you, if you're going to gather with family during this time of year, use this time wisely. Use this time to be a witness to those around you. Be a testimony to Christ Jesus. Be an instrument that the Lord can use to lead others to salvation. You're not going to be a good witness if everything you do during this time of year has to do with Santa or presents or drinking or partying or overeating and whatnot. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 and 18, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what conquered hath Christ with Belial? Or what part had, hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and my daughters saith the Lord Almighty in Ephesians 5 1 to 7 be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as become the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Dear saints, when you go hang out with family during this time of year, be as ambassadors for Christ Jesus. 
before you leave your house or before family comes over to your house, pray, literally pray, that our Lord God would use you during that time to be a light amongst darkness. Pray that you'd be made the light on top of a mountain in this dark world. Be an ambassador for the gospel of grace and use that time wisely. And remember one thing, you can be sure that you're going to be a spotlight for those that are lost. They're going to be watching you. They're going to be listening to every single word you say. So be careful what you do and what you say. Be cautious. You cannot take the words that come out of your mouth back. Once you say something, it's done. You can't unring a bell, okay? So choose your words wisely and carefully. Colossians chapter 4 verse 5 and 6 walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time what is Paul talking about here with this word without walk in wisdom toward them that are without the context here is the unsaved without salvation okay redeeming the time let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So, to recap this study, we know when Elizabeth got pregnant. We know Mary got pregnant six months later, around December. And then our Lord Jesus was born nine months after that, sometime in September. And now, you know where to find this information in your Bible, and you can prove it by using right division, Perhaps this would be something interesting to share with people when you gather for the holidays. Some interesting trivia that could possibly lead one of your relatives or one of your lost friends to Christ Jesus. By showing them that proof in God's word that there's nothing in there that says he was born on December 25th. And there's all the evidence in the world that he was, Mary got pregnant in December and she and in, in Jesus was born in September. If we choose to celebrate, for lack of a better word, Christmas, we should remember not to get distracted by the trees, the Santa Clauses, the reindeers, the lights, all the rituals, and so on. Okay, let's use this time of year, a year, a, a special time when people are most open to spiritual things. To share the wonderful news, the, the new life we have in Christ. And the new life that they can have in Christ Jesus too. If they trust him alone as their personal savior. And they know exactly what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross. Show them 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Explain to them the gospel. This is a wonderful, this is the wonderful gospel of the grace of God and it alone is the life giving message that lost people need to hear especially especially during this time of year one thing I absolutely refuse to take part in myself speaking personally would be midnight mass that the Catholics take part in on the night of Christmas this is something that I will not take part in. Taking part in a pagan ritual is taking things to a whole new level. And I highly suggest you don't go that far if you're going to hang out with your relatives and they happen to be in a different religion. I suggest you as a Christian, you as a saint of the Most High, do not take part in any, any type of celebrations which are deeply rooted in satanic activity, in paganism, and so on. Don't be seen, don't even be seen taking part in these things. Stay away from it. So we've looked at the timing of uh, our Lord's birth, and we looked at what you should be doing now that you know this information, what you should do as a saint. Also, I'm going to leave two links for you in, this, in the description box, the first one is going to be all about pagan origins of December 25th uh, being used as the celebration of our Lord. 
And the second video is going to be all about the wise men and what they saw in the sky and how they knew Jesus was being born before the world did. And I'm going to leave those two links in the description box. If you're interested in learning the pagan background of uh, the, you know, the, the religions, why they celebrate December 25th, then the video will be there for you. And I suggest you watch it. So that way, you know, the more information you have, the easier it'll be to explain to a lost person, uh, you know, why they shouldn't be taking part of it. So with that, I pray that each and every one of you, brothers and sisters, have a safe and healthy winter. Stay the course, run to win this race, and be a witness at all times. Remember, saints, we're ambassadors for Christ Jesus. We're here to do a job to plant seeds of salvation and to edify each other. We don't have much time left, so spend this time wisely. Spend it like it is your last day here on earth because it just might be. And one last thing, if you leave your house to go celebrate, don't forget to bring your Bible. Don't leave home without it. Grab your Bible, bring it with you, leave it in the car, so when the Lord opens a door for you, you can go grab His Word to share the truth and show them so they can see it with their own eyes. Be prepared to back up everything you say with God's Word, if it should come to that point. You get the idea. Thanks for studying with me, saints. Peace, love, and grace in Christ Jesus be with all of you. And I will see you on the next study, Lord willing.